I'll, I'll tell you how CNN got started. Oh, that's a great that's, story. Uh, you know, one time, you know, Ted Turner never liked the FCC. I mean, the FCC would, you know, regulated Channel 17 and, and Ted hated the news. He felt news made people feel bad. So, you know, we put the news on at like 3 a.m. so nobody could see. Is that one like <laughs> Tish or whatever? Yeah, yeah, what yeah, right, 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 Bill Tush. Tush. And, and he had a, you know, Tush. And a, he had a, a German shepherd who was his co-anchor and he'd have, you know, you know, the gorilla climbing the building behind him and all that. It just, you know, it's really uh, kind of uh, a joke type of news. But Ted didn't like it. And he also didn't like the fact that, you you know, these 30-year-old guys would come in once a year and they'd grill him and ask questions to get the, you know, get his license renewed. And we always feared that he would just, Ted would get disgusted and storm out and would lose the license for Channel 17. And Channel 17 basically was, you know, it's a UHF TV station. Right. And, and um, even though people would talk about him being in the cable industry, he really wasn't in the cable industry. The cable industry stole his signal. You know, they would rob his signal and spread it around the country. And, and at that time, you didn't get any credit from Nielsen and there was no advertising value for all these millions of homes that were watching on cable. So one night after the, uh, he had all his sessions for renewal, we were relieved that uh, he didn't, you know, he behaved, he didn't do anything that would make him lose uh, the license. So we went to dinner that night and we were talking and Ted said, well, we don't need the FCC anyway. We can go straight to cable. We don't have to have a broadcast signal. And if we don't have a broadcast signal, they can't tell us what to put on. And so that's true. So he said, well, let's yank the signal. Let's yank the signal and just go straight to cable. And Jerry Hogan, who was the head of sales, said, Ted, we'll lose all our advertisers. You know, they don't count cable homes. And so he said, ah, but we could do another network. We could do our own network to go on, only on cable. And nobody had ever done that before. And so we sat there. We thought, all right, well, if we did that, what could we do? And, and we said, well, what if we did all sports? And Ted said, no, no, there are not enough sports. You could never do an all sports, you know. Cable, uh, network. And then I'm sitting there and I'm trying to think of radio has formats. I said, well, Ted, what if we did music? And he said, music? That's stupid. Nobody's going to watch music on TV. That's ridiculous. There's no MTV then. And then we're going through it and I'm thinking about WGST radio in Atlanta. It had just become Atlanta's first all news Talk. radio station. It was it, just all news radio. And their theme was tune in, tune out, news whenever you want it. And so I said, well, how about news? Ted said, nah, I hate news. People make, you know, news makes people feel bad. And besides, nobody's going to sit down and watch news three hours at night. I said, Ted, it's not three hours at night. You just rotate the six o'clock news. You know, it's tune in, tune out, news whenever you want it. And he sat there. He said, news, news, news. He said, so if some guy kills his girlfriend and chops her up and puts her in a freezer, we could show the whole thing. And I said, well, I guess you could. Said, All right, we'll do news. And he jumped up, and then that was the birth of CNN. And that's how I got started. That's how he got started. So he, how he, did we, you get? How did they get the name CNN? Well, it was just Cable News Network. So just, you know, that was it. I mean, it was on the cable only. That's awesome. Hey, everybody, I got my good buddy Bob Hope here with us today. Um, if you don't know Bob Hope, then you don't know much about Atlanta, in my opinion. I mean, he's uh, he's he's the guy that makes a lot of made a lot of stuff happen in Atlanta back in the day especially with the Braves and the Hawks and his relationship with Ted Turner and a lot of other great stuff he's he's just this incredible ambassador for the community and um, I'm just thrilled to have him today and and uh, and he's a great storyteller so I love to tell stories and I love to hear good stories and Bob's got some great stories so um, Bob tell us a uh, Tell us a little bit about, I mean, you, what I understand, you were at Georgia State and you got a job with the Braves. Right. No, I was, uh, you know, I had to work my way through school and uh, we had some. My, That's a novel thing, by the way. Right, right. <laughs> and I, I wanted to go to college and really, yeah, I just wanted to go to college. So Georgia State was my option. And uh, in working my way through school, I started out working all night long on the graveyard shift at a packaging company. And I was so tired. It was a miserable job. And I kept thinking, I don't know if I can do this for four years. So I just made a list of places I'd like to work. If I, you know, if I had to work my way through school, and the Braves were number one on my list. And I showed up on a Saturday morning, and they had, at that time, they were operating out of trailers outside the, what was new Atlanta Stadium. At the it wasn't time. built yet? or It just... was built. It had just been built. It was there. And I, 
Um, the Braves had started yet or not? No, the they Braves didn't... were still in Milwaukee and they were about, you know, the Atlanta Crackers were, you know, playing their last season of minor league baseball in that stadium. And I just walked around. I met a guy named Jim Hay who was in one of the trailers. And, and I said, I'd like to apply for a job. I'm working my way through school. And he said, well, what kind of job would you like to do? And I said, well, let me tell you what I'm doing now. And I think any job you have is better than what I'm doing. And I filled out an application and he called me the next week and he said, and are you the guy that came by looking for a job Saturday? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, well, we've got some things you can do. And, you know, it was basically being a runner in the office. And then when the season started working the scoreboard and being an usher and, you know, pretty much a catch all. And that's how I got started. So I worked for the Braves and, uh, and then, Pretty quickly after that, you know, they, uh, the assistant PR director went into the Army for six months. And wow. They needed somebody to fill in for the season. So uh, Lee Walburn, who was the PR director, called me in and he said, um, you know, he started asking me questions. He said, do you know how to write a press release? I didn't know what a press release was. And I thought, well, if I say no, my interview's over. So I said, oh, absolutely. I write press releases <laughs> all the time. And he said, well, do you know how to do baseball statistics? Oh, yeah, man. I, I do them in my, you know, just really Sleep. Do all the time. I know how to do baseball statistics. And so he said, great, bring me examples tomorrow. And so, oh my God. So I went to the old Atlanta Constitution Sports Department. I had a friend there, uh, Richard Hyatt. And I said, Richard, I got to learn how to write a press release. So he and I just dummied out these press releases, did some baseball statistics on sheets of paper. And then I put them in a little you know, folder, and the next day I took him into Lee, and Lee looked at him, oh, these are pretty good. You know, he saw and, you know, and I thought I'd fooled him, but he said years later I didn't fool him at all. And he said, you know, you have the job. So I just started working there for, it was going to be for six months, and then just never left. And so when I was, you know, I graduated from college, and I was assistant PR director of the Braves, and then when Lee left, I was 24 years old. And, uh, and we were hosting the Major League Baseball All-Star Game, and Lee and I were the ones in charge of it. And so Lee was just a great friend, and he believed, you know, I just knew he believed in me. And he went to the ownership, and he said, you know, Bob's young, but he said, I think he can do the job. And by the way, if he leaves, you're screwed, because he's the only one who knows what's going on with the All-Star Game, which was a big deal. So um, I got the job, and they, well, they were really nice. When they called me in, they said, look, uh, you know, you're young, uh, this may be over your head, there's no shame if we have to bring in somebody over you, you know, just, but we're gonna give you a chance to do the job. Well, I was not gonna lose that job, man, I jumped in there. And luckily, you know, what you find, and it was just a lesson that's held true for years, is when sometimes when someone's young, they can do a much better job of something than someone's older because they're not, there are no boundaries. There's no restrictions mm -hmm. based on this is the way it's been done before and all. So mm -hmm. that all-star game, you know, just doing what seemed to be common sense. You know, I've been to the all-star game the year before and at, uh, in Detroit. And I, I was really disappointed because I'd uh, read about Super Bowl and all the lavish hospitality they had. And the all-star game, all they had was a continental breakfast and they only, you know, a stag. Only men could go to it. And I thought, well, they must not have enough money to do anything any better. So I planned out all this lavish hospitality and decorating the city and decorating the airport and having, you know, golf used to have, uh, you know, I guess everybody does now, but transportation committees where people would pick you up at the airport yeah. and all that sort of stuff. So I figured I'm going to do, you know, I researched, and I was going to do all that stuff. And, it was, and I had a budget and Major League Baseball allotted $40,000 for hospitality. Well, I, my budget was $600,000. So I thought, what am I going to do? So I went to see, see a guy named Moby Brewer, who was head of the Chamber of Commerce at the time. And I told him what I wanted to do, that we you know, have all these signs and it would be like a grand event, promote Atlanta. And he said, well, how much is it going to cost? And I showed him my budget, $600,000. And you could not do this today, I mean, ever. But he gets on the phone and he called Robert Woodruff at Coca-Cola. And then he called the head of Delta Airlines, the head of Atlanta Gaslight and the head of Southern Company, and he gets $150,000 from each of them. So I will go into a meeting that lasted probably 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and I walk out with $600,000, and we, we we put on this lavish hospitality, which I thought, you know, they just didn't have the money, and they're really going to be impressed. Well, the All-Star Game's on Tuesday, and everybody comes in Sunday. So Sunday night, you know, at the old Marriott, you know, I had a band playing, I had this giant buffet and it was just really decorated you know 
very nicely. And uh, my wife, Susan, actually was the first one. She wanted to go see it. So she goes down and Major League Baseball had hired the security. So Susan walks up and and they said, sorry, ma'am, you know, it's ma ma men only, you know, it's stag, men only for hospitality and baseball. And luckily Susan's walking away and, and Bill Lucas, who was our farm director, who later became the first African-American general manager in baseball, sees Susan, he said, where are you going? He said, well, they won't let me in, it's for men only. And, Bill grabbed her by the arm, walked up to the security guard, and he said, you know, they used to treat my people this way, too. And just they walked in, uh, and word got out, awesome. and suddenly all these women that had always gone to the All-Star game, you know, they just hit it and flooded the place. And by the end of the evening, everybody was having a great time. The band was playing, people were dancing. And I thought, I, you know, I just didn't know any better. And, you know, there are other things that were done that year, like I wanted to decorate the field. I thought the field, you know, just looked really boring the year before. So I... I knew the NFL had these logos in the middle of the field painted out. And I thought, how do you do those? So I went to the Falcons and they said, well, there's a guy in, in New Orleans that does all the stencils for all the NFL teams. Call him. They give me his number. And he said, well, send me a logo. So we had an all-star game logo. <laughs> and so I sent it to him. And he looks at it and he said, yeah, I can do this. And I said, well, how big can you do it? And he said, well, I do them in a high school gym. How big do you want it? I said, I want it as big as a high school gym. So he does this giant stencil and our ground crew gets out there and they paint this beautiful red, white, and blue logo for the all-star game in center field. And then on their own, they go up in the upper deck and look at it and think, well, that looks great, but it really looks lonely. So they go down and they paint red, white, and blue stripes up and down the first and third baseline. And then we had a team artist at work and they got with him and they, you know, painted the tops of the dugout, you know, looking really nice in the coaches' boxes. And I thought, this is so beautiful. Baseball is going to be so impressed. And when the game was about to start, he get a call to come down on the field from the umpires. And they said, well, all this paint on the field, all this, it's against the ground rules of baseball. We can't play the game. I said, hold on, we're about to go national team. No! We got to play the game. So they called the commissioner in. The commissioner was Bowie Kuhn, who was a really close friend of mine later, but I never met him. And the umpire said, well, you know, we got all this field painted and all this against the ground rules. And so he said, well, give me the, a copy of the ground rules. So the umpires go in and they get him the book and he's reading through it. And he just looks at him. He said, you know, this is an exhibition game. We can do whatever we want to. That's what I, said, I was thinking. I said, thank you, Bowie. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it just, but out of that, you know, it was, it turned out to be, um, I don't know if it was a step forward, but certainly a different all-star game. Yeah, but Bob, is anybody, I mean, that was basically the first time that ever happened. Oh, absolutely. Happened. And then after that, we put together a book, and it just sort of, I, I think it was, you know, as a kid, you looked at baseball as entertaining and fun. You wanted people to have a great time. And I think uh, the traditions of baseball were pretty much focused on the players on the field. You know, you just basically over right. to. And so, uh, you know, things like that just uh, – yeah, like I said, when you're a kid, you just don't, you you know, you're not, first of all, you're brave. And secondly, uh, you're not restricted by tradition. I ain't going to make my big fix. I'm not going to do that. So, so uh, when, tell me, I mean, so the Braves, how did the Braves come to Atlanta and then, um, did they have to originally do a lot of PR stuff to get people excited in Atlanta, yeah. or were they already excited because they wanted a team? Well, I think there was a lot of anticipation in Atlanta to have a team, but you got to remember, Atlanta was pretty much a small town. In the 60s. Yeah, you know, right? it was the 60s, and you know they had that sign up at, uh, in front of the Darlington Apartments on Peachtree there that said, you know, the population of Atlanta, and it was like 800,000. And then, you know, a few years later, we go over a million, and everybody celebrated. Well, it was... You know, it was the uh, Atlanta, Birmingham, Knoxville, Charlotte were all sort of in competition at the time to be the capital of the South. Well, um, what was happening is two cities really wanted Major League Baseball in the Southeast. You know, their baseball had been until recently when the Dodgers moved to San Francisco or to Los Angeles and, and the Giants to San Francisco had pretty much just been a Northeast and Midwest regional sport. I mean, even though it was Major League Baseball. And so the, the idea was if you could open up the Southeast, you'd have that whole, you know, quarter of the country out there as your, mm -hmm. um, as your base. Well, uh, Charlie Finley owned the, but then at that time, the Kansas City Athletics. And the Kansas City Athletics, he, he was from Birmingham, Alabama. 
and his intention was to move the athletics to Birmingham, and they would be the team for the South. And luckily, Ivan Allen Jr., who is the mayor of Atlanta, and also uh, you know Mills Lane, who was head of CMS Bank and all, and a few community leaders, wanted to get a big league team for Atlanta. So uh, they didn't have a place to play. So they felt like as an edge, they would, uh, what's the old line, they built a stadium with money they didn't have on land they didn't own for a team that <laughs> didn't exist. Didn't exist. And so they built the Atlanta Stadium, which was later called Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, for I think it was $17 million. I mean, just not, you know, in, by, in today's world, you couldn't build a stadium at all for anything like that. So they built this stadium, and the first time I thought it, I saw it, I thought it was the most magnificent thing I'd ever seen. But then, you know, they were in competition to try to get a team. And luckily for Atlanta, to move an American League team, which is the league that the A's are in, the athletics, you had to get 100% of all team votes. However, to move a National League team, which the Braves are in the National League, you only had to get 75% of the owners to vote. I didn't know that. And so... In this, you know, time when you couldn't get 100% of the American League teams to to vote, um, you know, the, well, the two options really for Atlanta because the A's would have moved to Birmingham were the Cleveland Indians or the uh, Milwaukee. Milwaukee Braves. Well, the in Indians, you were in the American League, you still couldn't get 100% of the vote. So the Braves, uh, they got said. So who bought them? Who brought them in? Uh, well, it was the same ownership that had them in Milwaukee. And... And they were, uh, Bill Bartholomew, we called me Chicago 12. It was a bunch of, uh, of I'd say, rich guys. And some of them were, um, you know, had inherited their money. Others uh, from Chicago who are really some pretty nice guys. And they uh, they brought the team down there. Um, and they, um, you know, and what you found is even though Major League Baseball was a big deal around, you know, in the Northeast and even in California where they moved, uh, the Southeast minor league baseball was big. And so um, the first year they drew okay. You know, the standard in baseball at the time was a million fans and drew pretty well, but then the interest sort of waned and it just became much tougher to, to draw fans. But, um, and then, you know, then we had some, some very positive things that were also distractions probably from uh, just enjoying pure baseball. Like uh, Hank Aaron's home run chase was magnificent. Oh my gosh. But it was the entire nation following one player who had right. to be playing baseball. It really wasn't a baseball story so much. But, um, you know, the Braves. So what a, did you do during those days from a PR standpoint to get people to come after well, it started winning? We, well, we did a lot. You know, we, we did promotions. And there were times you knew with promotionally that you could get people to come. Always, so fireworks would always work. Right. You know, and then we did. And, and we did things that uh, we didn't have much money to spend. So. Baseball was very traditional, so we were the first team to to get sponsors to pay for promotions. You know, we had uh, I think Burger King Bat Day was our first. You know, we got nobody Burger King. had done that. Before. Nobody had done that, it, but it was baseball to some degree. The purists were outraged. They thought we were prostituting the game. You know, you can't wow, yeah. get a sponsor involved in games like that. But we didn't have any choice. If we we're going to have Bat Day, we had to get somebody <laughs> to pay for it. So. And people would show up, but you know, what you'd have is it would spike for the big promotions. And then, you know, during the week, you'd kind of fade. Hope but, you make it. Yeah. And, you know, but what, as time goes by, you know, you, you look at the, the teams in baseball that have the most traditional followings, whether it's the Boston Red Sox, Chicago Cubs, you know, these teams, even Cincinnati Reds, that, you know, they have generations of families, Fans. you know, they you know, fathers take their sons and grandfathers take their sons and, and all. And we didn't have that in the South, but we eventually got it. I mean, right now the Braves are, you know, have a solid, you yeah. know, most people can't remember when the Braves weren't in Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's cool. So, all right. So then you're going along with the Braves and then I guess Turner comes in and buys yeah. the Braves. So, well, Ted Turner and I had a good relationship. I mean, uh, he had come in to televise the, you know, bought the TV rights to the Braves. To the Braves. And, uh, and he, since I, I worked there and we got Were you along. working for Turner at the time? I was or working Braves? for the Braves. And okay. then he bought it when he bought the Braves. Obviously, I was working for Turner, but it was, uh, but only on the Braves. And he, um, he had had me before he bought the Braves, whenever they would, the sales team would go out and sell sponsorships, you know, or sell advertising. 
uh, his rule was that either he was in the meeting or I was in the meeting to talk about the merchandising rights and stuff like that. So we established a pretty good friendship. Uh, when he bought the Braves, uh, you know, I always thought, well, you know, Ted just, even though we were friends, I thought, oh my God, it was scary. I thought Ted just seemed like he was out of his mind sometimes. But, and I found that we we really got along well, but what happened, which was, uh, I think it was pivotal. It's hard to say on hindsight exactly important moments, but uh, after he bought the Braves, uh, the rumor was that he was going to fire everybody in the office, the front office, and then he was going to bring in his own people. Well, I guess I was the youngest and probably the least expensive of his employees. So he would fire different people and turn their, tell me to run their department. So I was building this little empire unintentionally under me, but I still thought he was doing that to the point when he was ready to move people in, he was going to fire me too. And so uh, he was speaking at a banquet one night in Atlanta and it was, you know, Ted can give some good speeches and he can give some horrible speeches. Well, this was probably the most horrible speech <laughs> anyone could ever make. It was just all over the place. And I remember there was a candelabra down here with, with uh, you know, candles in it lit on one side. And he started talking about, he was wondering why the ones over here were burning faster than the ones over there, all this sort of business. Well, afterwards, um, there was a guy named Dave Center and Dave Center started uh, uh, one of the big companies in Atlanta. Um, yeah, let's try it. Oxford, Oxford uh, Industries. Industries, he started. And Dave was the CEO. And he was a friend, nice man. I mean, we went to, I went to high school with his daughter. And so he came, came to me at the reception. And he said, Bob, you know, uh, the, your new owner might be crazy. And I said, well, yeah, I sort of thought about that. <laughs> it seems a little different. And he said, he can fire you. He might fire you. And I said, well, I thought about that too. And he said, let me tell you something. There's no shame in getting fired. The only shame would be if you go down with a bat on your shoulder. While you've got a job, you give him everything he can handle. Wow, well, that's the next, great advice. The next day, T Ted and I were supposed to have lunch. And this was the first time just the only, just the two of us had had lunch. And I was thinking, you know, in my mind, I thought, well, this might be when he's going to sit down to fire me. And so I remember what Ted, what uh, Dave Sitter told me. As Ted walked in, I was already sitting in the, at the table. I got up and I walked over to him. I just remember taking every amount of nerve I had because I was 27 years old or something. And I put my finger in his chest and I said, Ted, before we get started, I got to tell you, I'm really worried about you. And he said, I was like, what are you worried about? And I said, you know, I am a very aggressive promoter and I just don't think you can keep up. Oh, Ted just lit up from that moment on. We Y'all best buddy. We just, we had a great time. We just, uh, there, you know, like anything went. There was no, I could come up with the stupidest promotion ever invented. And he would just think it was brilliant. He, he would do things like how in the world, you know, one time we uh, got, you know, we didn't have computers. So they, getting things organized wasn't always that easy. And one time we had uh, decided we were going to have a wedding at home plate because, you know, minor league baseball had weddings at home plate. We weren't sure how to get a bride. So Skip Carey, one of our announcers, I told him, I just go on the air and tell if anybody wants to get married at home plate, call me. Here's the number. Well, we had uh, 13 different couples call and want to get married. Wow. We were trying to figure out which one. I said, well, why don't you just do them all? We'll have the world's largest wedding. See? And so you know, we had a, gave them a reception in the stadium club. But, you know, it was, I mean, it was a wedding. You know, we had a justice of the peace up there. And each of the brides and the you know grooms, they had their entourages with them and all. And uh, so we were going to do that. And then uh, we realized that we had scheduled wrestling on the field the same day, just by mistake. And so I called Jim Barnett, who was head of wrestling. And I said, we need to change your date. And he said, you can't change the date. We're going to televise it and tape it and then show it the next night on TV. So we can't change it. So I negotiated with him. I said, all right, we'll have the weddings before the game and wrestling afterwards. And so <laughs> we're sitting around and trying to figure out how are we going to explain this? So we said, well, we're just going to tell everybody it's wedlock and headlock day. And we planned it all along. And I was waiting. And <laughs> Ted came in and said, that is so creative. How did you ever think of doing wrestling? And did wrestling your mind just come day? up with that? I mean, you just but like that just but, happened you know, for you? But we pretended like we had always been thinking about doing it that way. But you just, you know, that can, but yeah, it's sort of like, if you did something like that in isolation, people would look at you like you're out of your mind. 
But when you do something like that every day, it becomes colorful and fun <laughs> and conversational. Not just for us, but I mean, the news media, they just loved all that stuff. They were always, you know, <laughs> what, what, the, what is he dreaming up now? That's right. We had things like on opening night, you know, when, the, let's see, Star Wars and, you know, Close Encounters of the Third Count, all these movies were coming out. We decided we were going to, we got ham radio operators in the upper deck and they would were blasting out the message to outer space as to when <laughs> opening night was and the pregame ceremonies and inviting, you know, UFOs to land. You know, we're going to prove whether they are not because they'll know that a baseball game is a friendly environment. Well, you know, it's like, <laughs> we're doing that, which has cost nothing, and it was a silly promotion, but the media was all over the country. All these disc jockeys would call every day, and they're, at, you know, they're interviewing you and asking, you know, do you really think they're UFO? I said, I don't think there are. I just don't believe in it. And, you know, they said, but we're going to find out. If they land, you know, it's gonna, if they land, it's going to be the biggest opening night in the history of baseball. And <laughs> they'd laugh and Sports Illustrated did a two-page spread. They had these cartoons of spaceships landing the stadium. And it just kind of, it just sort of took off. It was just fun. So, so how did... Turner become the manager, right? Didn't he? He yeah. decided to make himself the manager no, or the coach. Well, well, we decided to, you know, I mean, we'd lost 17 games in a row, and that was, it was the lost. opening of the season. Yeah, 17. Yeah, you know, 17. You know, we, I think we went eight and five, and then we lost 17 games in a row. The year before, we went eight and five and lost 13 games in a row, <laughs> which are both records. And uh, it was the end of the 17 game losing streak, and we're trying to figure out what do we do. And he's in my office and we're pacing around and all, and and he said, we we got to fire the manager. Who are we going to get to be? I'll, I'm, I'll manage the team. I said, that's, that's, that's a great idea, not long term. <laughs> and he said, but I don't have the time. I can't manage it the rest of the season. I said, Ted, manage it one game. I promise you, you're not going to have to manage it the rest of the season. I said, the commissioner, the president of the National League, man, they're going to have you out of that dugout so fast. And so it just – you know, it's just a colorful moment, just something to do. How to, long did he manage? How many one games? game? I mean, it was just one. Let, yeah, they don't let him manage <laughs> two games. Oh, I thought, I thought I remember it lasting like <laughs> no, a week or no, something, no. but it was all it the was rage. One right? game, no, and things like that, or you know, there's a, you know, what's the the definition of news since 1890 is that, you know, when a dog bites a man, that's not news, but if a man bites a dog, that's news. <laughs> well, we just were out there. You know, we used to say it's. Better to go down the street as a village idiot and be noticed and not be noticed at all. So we were always trying to figure out how to be the village idiot and at least get attention. So tell me about the all these Braves baseball players that you got to meet in all those years. Well, I mean, who it, are some of your favorites? Well, my favorites. I mean, we were lucky in that we we had um, certain key players who were just wonderful people. I mean, Hank Aaron could not have been a nicer person. I mean, for somebody to go through what he went through, which wasn't all bad. I mean, you, you read about it and it sounds like he just got volumes and volumes of hate mail. He really got volumes and volumes of volumes of fan mail, but he got some percentage of hate mail. And the hate mail was pretty vicious. And, and it also made you realize that he was in danger anytime. So mm -hmm. you had uh, security with him and there was, uh, you know, there was a day when the FBI came in, didn't want him to play because they thought they had a, you know, real threat against his life that day. And Hank just said, I'm a baseball player. I'm going to play, He'd figure out how to protect me. So Hank was, Hank was just great. He was gracious. I mean, uh, a story I tell that just, I think kind of uh, depicts his personality is uh, into the home run chase. When well, we had like 400 media traveling with the team, I was just like a real circus. Uh, and he was at interviews all day long and then before the game, we'd have a pregame press conference. After the game, we'd have a uh, postgame press conference. And you had all these writers. Well, you know, if you had 50 players, the two teams, 25 players per team, available for interviews, there was only one player that anybody in the media was one interested in. It was all the pressure was on him. Well, about, I'd say, two years before the actual record was broken, we get a call from Murphy Candler Little League. And they're having Murphy Candler Little League Day. And they said they had a youngster on the team that had leukemia and wanted to know if he could get his picture made with Hank Aaron. And I said, sure. So we just had his picture made with Hank before the game. Well, not through anything we did. I made probably Murphy Cannon Little League. The uh, picture showed up in the newspaper the next day explaining it. Well, suddenly my phone just starts ringing. And you have all these parents with a child that has some terrible disease and they want mm -hmm. to meet Hank Aaron. So 
I talked to Hank and so every day, every game, you know, we're meeting a group of kids and their parents and we're taking them down to the dugout to meet Hank Aaron. And, and I'm thinking, you know, two thirds of these kids aren't sick. You know, these parents are just using it as an excuse for the kid to meet Hank Aaron. So I'm getting pretty frustrated with it. And I go to a national league meeting and they say, here's some new rules. No kids are allowed in the dugout before the game. And so I go to Hank and I said, Hank, man, I can save you some time when you just go back in the clubhouse and sort of rest and be by yourself because we're not allowed to bring kids to the dugout. So, you know, you don't have to meet all these kids. And besides, you know, most of them aren't sick. And Hank said, but some of them are. And he said, I, I want to keep doing it for the ones that are. And so we did that. And I never, there was a, never a moment when I really enjoyed doing that. We'd have to, either I'd have to take them down or somebody would every single game. And I just, you know, did not like it. Well, several years later, I was walking through an airport in LA, in the Los Angeles airport, and a man walked up to me and he said, you're Bob Hope, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, you don't remember me. And I told him I didn't. <laughs> and he said, several years ago, I gave you a call and my 12 year old son, we were in Orlando, we were coming through Atlanta and we were on our way to Houston. He was gonna have open heart surgery. And said, you know, ask if he could meet Hank Aaron. And he said, fine, took him down. Hank signed the baseball, gave it to him, had his picture made with it. He said, uh, he died on the operating table in Houston. He said, I just want to tell you what it meant. We buried him with that baseball and in a Braves uniform and said that was the best day of his life. And I thought, well, Hank, just, that was just, nobody knew he did that except me and I didn't like it. It was like, right. you know, he just always was so kind. That stuff in the background. And, and he also had this in, in amazing ability just to treat everybody the same. You know, with Hank, you could, you know, he certainly, you know, Bill Clinton, all these presidents, uh, you know, Bill Clinton, uh, you know, George W. Bush, I mean, all of them, you know, George W. Bush owned the Rangers, so they were all big in baseball and they'd come to his events and you'd, you know, Bill Clinton, I probably went to 10 different events where he was there for Hank. And Hank would, you know, if you were president or you were a kid or you were just somebody, you know, the, uh, working for the hotel, to Hank, you were all the same. And I thought, you know, what an amazing personality trait that was. And then uh, others we had, Phil Necro was equally as nice. I mean, Phil was, uh, you know, first of all, <laughs> Phil should have, been in the Hall of Fame longer before, you know, he got in the Baseball Hall of Fame, but he won 318 games in the big leagues. And what people don't think about, I guess, or I think about it sometimes, is he never started a game until he was 27 years old because he threw the knuckleball and people didn't think, you know, didn't view it as a real a pitch, you know, it was kind of a trick pitch. And luckily the Braves in 67 were so bad that they, or 68, I guess, they, they just put him in there. <laughs> let him start. What was he playing before? Well, he he was a relief pitcher, but the catchers couldn't catch the ball. So when he'd come in, runs would score. So they'd send him back down to Triple A, and then they'd bring him up. And really? He was up and down, up and down. Well, finally, they let him start, and he he I think he was eleven and one in his first twelve starts. Who just you know really had a wow. a, a solid streak, which made him a. Uh, a regular starter, and so he went on to win 318 games, which is a lot of games. That's a lot. Of a lot of games in baseball, and uh, but he also won. Yeah, you know, like one year he won 23 games for a last place team. You know, we used to sit in these meetings and say, "What? You know, how do we get better for next year?" I said, "Well, the way I look at it is just get three more Phil Negros because if he can win 24 games, we're there with a bad team. You get three of them, they'll win 100 games. We'll win the pennant." But uh, you know, Phil was just kind. Of, you know just a gentle, gentle person. And, uh, you know, he, he would be the chairman of big brothers, big sisters. And I'd walk down to, I remember I was in the clubhouse and he calls me over and he said, I want you to be a big brother. I'm chairman of the big brothers association. I want you to be a big brother. I said, Phil, I'd be a terrible big brother. I said, I know you're supposed to call these kids, take them places. I'd never call them. I said, I just, he said, well, I want you to try it. So he assigned me an eight year old boy named, uh, Philip Lewis and Philip, you know, I, really didn't seem to have a chance. I mean, he was adopted. His father died in a auto wreck. His sister was really, who was also adopted, was just a darling. And she was a bright student. He wasn't a good student. And so, you know, I go to McDonald's with him to meet him and all and talk to him. I think this is going to be hard. And then I keep thinking, I got to call him. I got to call him. Well, I didn't realize he was going to call me. And so 
every week I'd get a call from you saying, what are we going to do next? Well, I work for the Braves. And so I just, you know, Susan would pick him up. I'd pick him up. We just bring him to the ballpark. He knew all the players. He would operate the scoreboard during the game. He'd just do whatever. He knew all the Falcons players. And so it just, it, it, you know, he, almost, he really literally became part of our family. But they take in big brothers and big sisters. They're not really your son. And so when they graduate from high school, you know, you just need to turn them loose, let them go off on their own. And so uh, Philip took me to dinner one night when he graduated from high school and he was going off to to college. And I thought there's no way he's going to get through college. And I'd never heard from him for years. And then I uh, opened up the newspaper one day and there's an editorial written by Philip Lewis, the senior vice president of Alexis Nexus, talking about what it meant to have a you know big brother. So that was because of Phil Necro. Wow. And then the other one, who's one of my still one, one oh, well, all of them are good friends. Well, two more. Dusty Baker, who's finally gotten his due. I mean, I love Dusty. I just, you know, I went to Houston this past year for a Rotary convention, and I called. I bought two tickets to an Astros game, and I have Dusty's cell phone number. And they were in uh, in Kansas City, and called him and said, "said I'm coming to the game tomorrow night in Houston. You know, any chance I could see?" And he said, "Sure." You know, he gives me the name of the guy to call to make the arrangements. And, I call him and I tell the guy, I said, look, Dusty and I are friends. We're not best friends or anything, but we've been friends for a long time. And uh, anyway, when I go, this guy meets us. And I said, I, I thought you said that you and Dusty were just friends. He, I told him, he said, you were one of his best friends ever. And I thought, and then we would go down the dugout and he just is so nice. And then, and you, you know, and you stay in touch. Like when Hank Aaron died, Dusty Baker and I were the only two non-family pallbearers in the funeral. So you just, mm. and, and you just kind of, uh, sometimes you, you don't realize how close a friend you are with someone until something like that happens. And then the uh, final one is Dale Murphy. And Dale Murphy still, we talk all the time. He's great. In fact, I always tell people you go into a Braves game, go to Murph's restaurant ahead of time because the parking's better there. You just walk across the bridge. But if you go in and eat dinner at Murph's restaurant, you're likely to be eating dinner with Dale because he'll come over and sit he with He comes a lot, man. He? he comes all the time. Yeah, he's the uh, Murph. I got to know him. He, I had a clothing store. Yeah, and the barber shop was next door, and he had all those kids. You remember? Oh yeah. And he couldn't. They didn't have enough chairs for all of them, so he would hang out with me in the clothing store while a couple of them were getting their hair cut, and then he'd switch them back. So I kind of got to know Murph, and yeah, he got us down on the field and all that kind of stuff back in the day. It was awesome. Oh yeah, no, he great he, guy. He does have you know two of his sons played in the NFL. You. You know, they were offensive linemen. You have this, two of Dale sons? Two of them. And, I didn't know that. And you have this vision of these big, burly guys. And if you see them now, they just look like, you know, look like you. I mean, they just beefed them up, I guess, to play in the NFL. Big guys, not that big. So what and about Nakahoma? Not, well, Nakahoma, I, I could tolerate. <laughs> I miss him. Well, I could tolerate Nakahoma. And back then, you know, the, the Indian issues and all that weren't quite as big. Today, you probably couldn't do Nakahoma. But people... <laughs> <laughs> people, uh, people in the office would get all upset, you know, other man, because Nakahoma wasn't dependable and he would, Nakahoma would do this, do that. I said, look, yeah, guys, you gotta remember, this guy dresses up like an Indian. He goes out and makes appearances all the time. If you want him to be like you, it ain't gonna happen. He's just a different kind of guy. But, you know, he was delightful. I mean, he just, uh, we would, the newspaper, I told you, you know, the newspaper would treat anything we did in promotions as, you know, they just have fun with it. Well, each year uh, I would have to negotiate with Nakahoma to, you know, to sign up with what the team deal was. And so we, it wasn't really a, a money negotiation as much as it was uh, amenities to his teepee. And so I have to put <laughs> air conditioning in his teepee and, and the newspaper would run it, you know, every day, like here's what, what's happening with the negotiations for Nakahoma. But he, he was quite a character. He was a character. Oh, yeah. All right, so how do we get to the Hawks? Tell me about the Hawks story. Well, um, you know, Ted bought the Hawks, and he uh, called me in one day, and he said, Bob, um, what do you know about basketball? And I said, well, not, not much. <laughs> I played when I was a kid a little, but I don't really follow it that close. And he said, great, great. He said, I want you to go run the Hawks. And I said, run the Hawks, what do I do with my job now? He said, you still do it, but I want you in your spare time to run the Hawks. And I said, Ted, I don't know anything about basketball. And he said, that's perfect. I want you to cut the payroll in half, 
lose every game, get the number one draft pick, but I want you to promote like crazy so we don't lose any money. But there was a guy named Marvin the Human Eraser Webster who was supposed to be the next Kareem. And Ted, you know, at that time, if you had the worst record, you get the number one pick. And so he felt like, you know, if, I, if he had me running the team, that there was no chance that we would have anything out of the worst record. So I go over there, and, and luckily, you know, he said get it rid of everybody in the office and just get others like me who would sort of run the team on the side. And uh, Stan Caston, who was uh, our intern at the, the Braves, free intern, uh, Bill Lucas and Stan didn't get along, and so Bill talked Ted into firing the guy, even though we weren't paying him. And Stan was all upset. We were having lunch one day, and uh, he said, "Oh, you're so lucky." He said, "I love basketball." And he's talking to me, and I realized this guy knows a lot about basketball. Plus, he's a lawyer. And so I thought, I went to Ted, and I said, "Can I transfer Ted? You know, his non-salary over to the Hawks?" He's still an intern. He, yeah, he's still an intern, and he came over to the Hawks, and and we went through this whole deal of trying to cut the payroll in half, which was already the lowest payroll. The payroll was $750,000 for the whole team. And uh, so we ended up with all rookies and cast-offs. I mean, we were at a worst team ever assembled. We had, it, you know, because you just can't win with all rookies and cast-offs. We had Tree Rollins as a rookie. We had Butch Lee. We had Goose Gibbons. We had uh, you know, Eddie Johnson from Auburn. We had all these, uh, we had, uh, Charlie Chris, who was a five foot six, thirty year old rookie guard, we had you know the only legitimate NBA player we had was uh, John Drew, and, and the reputation of John Drew is on drugs, so we couldn't get rid of him. Nobody would Thank take you. him. So we start the season, and we jump off to like a nine and two start, and you know which we're supposed to lose all the games. So Ted calls me and he is absolutely furious that I disobeyed his orders. But then the team was like a, a Rocky team. You know, they're going through the NBA and they're not supposed to win a game. They obviously were outmanned every team they played, but they still kept winning. And the team made the playoffs and Ted got excited about The first year? It. Oh, they made the playoffs. They were And Hubie Brown, who was a coach, was coach of the year in the NBA. <laughs> it's just like, it's horrible. You know, people would say, Bob, you did such a great job. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. So um, when did Maravich come in? Well, that was way before my time. Oh, it was? Yeah, it was way before my time. That was when they were trying to win. <laughs> <laughs> he was, you know, I remember him as a kid. He was awesome. Oh, yeah. All right. So then uh, let's move on to uh, the Olympics, maybe. Is that kind of next thing? Well, I mean, I, I've been involved in a lot of Olympics in the past. And uh, actually, two Olympics, uh, the two that have been in this country, Atlanta and then uh, Salt Lake City, and which a long time ago, 2002. When you say involved, what do you mean by involved? Like I, on the committee? Well, that's or? what I was going to say. I, I, I was on the committee here for Atlanta, uh, the marketing committee, and sort of helped them put together the first pitch and all that. But I really, I was involved mostly working with sponsors in Atlanta. You know, Coca-Cola, we were there organizing marketing committee, and we did the the pen trading and, you know, Coca-Cola Olympic City and some things yeah. like that, just working through the planning. And, you know, obviously a lot of people get involved. And then similar thing with Salt Lake City, where Salt Lake City was great because the president of the Americas called me in and he said, look, I can't go to all the planning meetings. You're me. You just go to the meetings and make sure everything looks like it's part of one plan. And so that was a lot of fun. And, you know, I love going to the Olympics. I mean, it's just, they're just uh, fun because the athletes are, you know, they'll be like in 96, you get on the MARTA train and the Romanian gymnastics team would be on MARTA. It would just, you know, and it just, just has a spirit and an atmosphere about it. I love the Winter Olympics. I have to say one of the, the greatest events I've ever been to, maybe the greatest, were the Lillehammer Olympics in Norway because you it's just a, just a lovely little picturesque Norwegian town and uh, their mascots were a little boy and a little girl. I forget the names of them, but they'd sing this little song, which I'm sure people in Norway hated to hear because they hear it all from the time. They, but we'd never heard it before, and it just, you know, it just created a really neat mood. So what do I not know about the Olympics? What's something that people don't understand? Well, <laughs> one of my, I was, uh, had the plans for the, for Coca-Cola and for Federal Express for the Winter Olympics in 1988, which are in uh, Calgary. And so 
uh, you have to run them by the head of the Olympic Committee, who at, at that time was Juan Antonio yeah. Samarites, the head of the International Olympic Committee. And so the only time he could meet was in the Savoy Hotel in London the morning of the Wimbledon finals. And so <laughs> we fly over and I have Nancy Altenberg, my contact with FedEx and somebody from Coca-Cola go with me. And, and I prepared a book with the presentation of the programs for Coca-Cola and, and, uh, and for Federal Express. And I'm, and uh, we go in there and Juan Antonio Samarach is like, he's like me now, he's an old man in there. And he had this 30 year old wife or something, just blonde, just and she was running around in her terry cloth robe and all. I'm sitting in the in his suite and I'm waiting for him to come in. He comes in, he sits down, I go over the plans with him, my, my nice little full color book. And I'm thinking this is gonna look so good. And at the end of it, I said, what do you think? And he said, I hate it. I said, you hate it? What do you ha what can I change? You gotta change it all. And I said, so, What's wrong with it? He says, too commercial. The Olympics aren't commercial. It's too commercial. And so I thought, oh my gosh, I've just screwed up now. I got to start all over. And Dick Pound, who was head of the marketing for the Olympics, he's sitting in the room and we walk out the door. And I said, oh my God, what do I do now? And he said, well, go do it. Just go do all of it. And I said, hold on. He just said he hated it. He said, you've done what you were supposed to do. You presented it to him. You gave him a chance to say it's too commercial. Now go do it. <laughs> so, so go do it like we, you were going we just to do went, it? We never changed the thing. We just went and did it. And I thought, boy, the politics, the Olympics are not just confusing, they're crazy. But that's what it was. Wow. Wow. Um, you put uh, silver bullets together, the girls' baseball oh, yeah. teams. Well, that Tell was, me about that. Well, you know, Hank Aaron, I mean, that was influenced greatly by Hank. Hank used to, uh, when he played Negro League baseball one year, uh, he, you know, he, and he'd tell wonderful stories about playing the Negro Leagues, just hysterical stories. But one of the things he said is, uh, you know, they had a, um, a second baseman in the Negro Leagues named Tony Stone. And Tony Stone was, she couldn't play in the uh, All-America Girls Baseball League because she was black and it was segregated. The only place she could play was in the Negro Leagues. But she was the all-star second baseman. And she was a great awesome. athlete. She hit about 280. She just really was... You know, she was playing with the men, but she was good. And they had a couple others that weren't quite that good who played in that league. And uh, Hank just would say, you know, if, you know, if women were given a chance, he said, I think, you know, they could actually be excellent baseball players. He said, might even, you know, have an end up with a second baseman or infielder in the big league someday, but you got to give them a chance. And it just made me realize I had two daughters. And I thought, well, it's kind of crazy that, that baseball, just through nothing other than tradition, is a male sport. You know, you just don't open it yeah. up for women. You know, you look at soccer, soccer, you know, women play soccer, men play soccer, and they're, even though they play separately, they're pretty much equal games. Same thing with basketball. And so I kept figuring that um, I just wanted, to, first of all, Major League Baseball had some medical studies that said women couldn't play baseball, that their forearms were too weak and their legs went this way rather than that way or whatever. And I, I don't, I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me, but I don't know. So uh, I just wanted to prove that women could play. So um, I was, uh, Coors Beer wanted us to come up with something that was mainstream sport. They said mainstream sport is baseball, football, basketball. And, uh, you know, they wanted something that they could take around to all their distributors. They said, and then Leo Kiley, who was the CEO of Coors, said, I'd, I'd love for you to come up with something that would make my old grand." a granddad pap who caught for the Red Sox roll over in his grave. And so I thought about it and I've been wanting, you know, wanting to try to uh, have a, a team of women just to see how well they could play. So I went back to him and said, look, as an experiment, let's do it right. Let's put together a, the best female athletes we can find who can play baseball. And there are no women's teams to play. Let's tour them around, have them play men's teams and uh, just, you know, we'll get them a great manager, great coaches. Uh, we'll fly them, put them in nice hotels, pay them a good salary. Let's, but let's see how they do. And we don't know. And so we put together the silver bullets, uh, you know, major league baseball at first was, you know, felt it was a travesty. Then they kind of warmed up. Minor league baseball loved it because, uh, 
it was an extra opening and they could, uh, you know, draw a crowd and make some money. And so uh, we had tryouts around the country. I think we had about 5,000 women show up. We, wow. we didn't know if, uh, you know, I, mean, I, I think we underestimated what muscle memory means because we found unless somebody played one hell of a lot of softball, they really couldn't, couldn't adapt to baseball. We, at first we thought, well, I'm not sure we can find pitchers. So we'd say, if we can't find pitchers, we'll have guys come in to pitch. But we realized there, there were plenty of women pitchers because what really? would happen, oh yeah, is, you know, in T-ball and in, in young little league, boys and girls play together. And then when the girls get like 10 years old, they send them to softball. Right. Unless the girl is your best pitcher. And then they hold on to her one more year and one more year. So we had a select group of pitchers who had one more year all the way through high school because they were always the best pitcher on the team. And we had, for instance, Pam Davis in Tampa, Florida, was the all-star right-handed pitcher in Metro Tampa when she was a senior. It was 12-1. and one. Well, there were eight players who played with her in Tampa who were in the big leagues, but she was the all-star. And she just, she was like a little Greg Maddox. She could just hit the corners and she, you know, it, there was nothing she couldn't do. She couldn't throw the ball 100 miles an hour, but she could throw it 80. Well, that's what Greg did. And then um, we had uh, Leanne Ketchum from Alabama. One time I asked her if she was the all star, uh, you know, pitcher as a senior in the state of Alabama. And I asked her one time, I said, How many other girls play baseball in high school in Alabama? And she said, I think I was the only one. But that was, you know, so that you had a reasonably good pitching staff. And Phil Necro put together an incredible coaching staff. And, and a lot of reasons for it. One is he wanted to open the door to women and girls to play baseball. Just it's his sport. And he felt like that's half the world. Um, the other thing that all the coaches liked is uh, they said, an 18-year-old boy, you can't tell him anything. You know, they, if you tell them you got to change your batting stance or you're <laughs> not throwing the ball right or something, they'll say, no, no, I'm this is what I, I, this is the way I do it. And they just don't change. Uh, Phil used to say the women had elephant ears, you know, they'd listen, they want to learn and they'd Wanted keep to give up. it. So we got to a point, the first year was hard. You know, they hadn't seen a lot of pitches and they, you know, have, <laughs> we, we had more 200 hitters on a team than any team in history. But then by the fourth year, they were very competitive. We, we had like 13, 300 plus hitters. Uh, they were playing much better competition. I, one game we played at uh, in Frontier Stadium in Rochester, Minnesota, which is in the um, Kodak parking lot, and they were having it was a New York Penn League All Stars playing the Silver Bullets, and we get there and John Barr we were watching the warm up. He said, "Who in the world scheduled this game?" Because you know scheduling was a little tough to try to figure out what level. And these were fa what they call Fast A players. These were the top prospects that big league teams had. So. It you know, introduced the silver bullets and it was looked like you know, just your daughters. I mean, it did they, you know they they weren't particularly big. They just were athletic, but they didn't look it. I mean, it just kind of a bunch of girls coming out. And then they introduced <laughs> the New York Penn League All Stars. They looked like the Chicago Bears coming out on the field. And John said, "This is ridiculous. This is embarrassing. Who would schedule this game?" Well, the silver bullets get going. And they, I just compared them like the 1952 Chicago White Sox. They were just, you know, they couldn't hit home runs so much, but they could go base to base to base. And so the game was tied zero to zero in the fifth inning. And, you know, because Pam Davis was hitting the corners and these guys couldn't hit her, and, but the Silver Bullets couldn't hit them either. And then suddenly we get a player on first somehow, you know, and then a player on first and third. And, the Silver Bullets execute a delayed double steal. Well, wow. the, the women knew the fundamentals. These guys had never seen a delayed double steal their entire life. So, and what happens is, you know, the player on first takes off for second. second, and then the catcher starts to throw the ball, and then he sees the runner coming in from third, and you catch him in half stride, and he bloops the ball to the outfield. Well, suddenly both runs score. They were up two to nothing. I still remember John Barr looking at him and says, these women are going to win this game. They're going to win this game. Well, they did because from then on, the guys were so rattled because a group of women was going to be, you know, we're the all-stars. These women are beating us. And they, they won. That's awesome. And that, why did that fall? Or quit? Well, what happened is we did it for four years and, and you find that tradition is 
difficult to overcome for a lot of reasons. Uh, even though people won't overtly say that they're um, sexist or whatever, uh, you know, uh, workman's comp. But you got to have workman's comp insurance. Well, we wanted to pay the same workman's comp that the Braves paid. And I'll say it was like $40,000 a year as a premium. Now that the workman's comp board said, no, you're one team. I said, no, we're a professional baseball team. You're one team, so we have to charge you worst case, which is like $350,000 wow. a year. And then um, and then the, uh, the federal government came to us and... Uh, said that we were promoting beer sales. It was a Silver Bullets baseball team that we were promoting beer sales to little to kids and that we had to stop. So, huh. and, then, and then we thought about it and said, well, the reality of it is a touring team is probably not the answer, but at least uh, we've proven that women can play baseball very well. And now, there is, point. Yeah, now there's a, a World Cup of women's baseball and and uh, you know, amateur baseball, USA baseball has a women's team, and you know, it's it certainly hasn't achieved the level of acceptance that we were hoping. It's not a traditional sport for for women and girls yet, but it's it's being played by women and girls. And by the way, in some countries, it's really a big deal. You know, Australia, uh, Japan, uh, the Netherlands, women playing. And they're baseball. playing baseball, not softball. They're playing baseball, and and what you find is that's because there's really no tradition there, and also. We televised, they televised 20 Silver Bullets games, ESPN did, and, and uh, later Fox, and a year. Well, those games uh, were were good filler. I mean, they were great for international play. They'd have to put something on their international network, so they would play the Silver Bullets over and over. So in Japan, these places, they'd see they Silver Bullets play, and they liked that. So what, were you involved, or I know, had, what about when Coke changed their formula? But, it was like you, you knew a little something. Well, I, I was in, I, you know, I was in the bunker, which uh, they call they call What's you. What's know, the bunker? The, uh, on, uh, there were very few people that knew what was going on, and so they'd call you in on a Saturday morning and they'd present to you the greatest marketing all, idea of all time. And <laughs> I got called in on a Saturday morning. And they presented to me they were going to change the formula of Coke and all, and I I reacted like the public did when they first said, "You can get your socks blown off. This is ridiculous." But then they show you all the um, research they have to prove that it couldn't fail and you think well I guess I'm the only one who thought that way and then you kind of buy into it so um, you know they launched New Coke and then uh, you know fairly quickly after that we were in these secret meetings in New York and and I, I there were probably I guess there were 10 of us in our group we didn't know there was another group meeting someplace else our assignment was you got to make it work figure out how to make it work Every day they'd come in with these, you know, how all the, you know, you'd see all the negative publicity, but also the research on how many people hated it. And then also the sales are going down and all that. And you'd sit there, there's, there's no answer to it. There was no idea we were going to come up with that was going to be big enough to make this stuff work. Uh, what we didn't know, there was a, another group meeting in another building that was deciding if we bring it back, you know, bring back old Coke, how do we do it? When they obviously were the ones that did it. But it was uh, it was an interesting time. But also, uh, in the process, you you just see how a corporation can sort of get caught up in its underwear or whatever. Because um, I'm going to tell you, the, the, uh, there are two things. Sergio Zeman was the head of marketing for Coke, and Sergio had come for Pepsi, and Pepsi had the Pepsi Challenge. Well, in the Pepsi Challenge, where it's a taste test between Coke and Pepsi, Pepsi's sweeter. So if in blind taste tests, Pepsi typically won because it's sweeter. So Sergio wants to change the formula of Coke to be sweeter, tastes more like Pepsi because he's a Pepsi guy. And then uh, Roberto Gazueta, who is the CEO of Coke, is a chemist. And so I sat down and listened to him talk about it and all, and it, it was all about availability of ingredients, you know, the staying power of the ingredients once they're, you know, how long you can store it and it won't break down. It was all chemistry. And you know, I, and, was, not, and not PR. Yeah, you know, and, and you're sitting there, and, and then the advertising. You know, Sergio Zima would say, "Well, the advertising will convince people." I say, "You don't have an advertising problem; you have a public perception problem, and no amount of advertising is going to change that." So, how when did you like leave the Braves and start your own firm? And well, I mean, I there's working for Ted Turner. He had five direct reports. I was the youngest. He treated me fine, but his expectation levels were very high. And you wanted to, 
achieve that. And he'd tell you, he'd sit down. I remember the first time he sat down with me and said, uh, and I was his promoter, so whoever his promoter was would get the same speech. He'd say, Hope, oh, you and I have the magic touch. You know, nobody else has the magic touch. And we can take ordinary things and we can make them shine. We can make them great. Well, the first time he told me that, I thought he lost his mind. You know, nobody has the magic touch. But he tells you that over and over again. Suddenly you start thinking, damn, I got the magic touch. You know? <laughs> and he was like doing the wedlock and headlock or whatever, you know, just coming up with crazy ideas. And he and, believed it though himself. Yeah, no, he and he, he believed it. And he, he believed that I had the makings of it. He'd sit me down sometimes and say, you know, uh, you know, envision what you could be and uh, that you could do the same kind of things he could do. Well, I mean, I knew that I would never. I just couldn't commit my life to doing, you know, to the intensity that he threw into things. But um, it, it just, uh, but, you know, that, that pressure of working with him, then you're doing the Braves and the Hawks and you're doing the television station and the TV and all. And it's just, um, and you see there were five of us who reported to him. Uh, one of them had a stroke and died at 42. Uh, you know, a couple of them had heart attacks. They all went through divorces. And I had two little girls at home and, and, I remember I was going to go in and tell him I was leaving to go to work for Coca-Cola. And Jerry Hogan, who is a sales guy, said, Bob, you know, he, he, you know, he thinks you're like his son. He's not going to take this well. And I remember I went in and he cried. I mean, he was just like, you know, it's like, how could you possibly leave? And I said, well, look, you've been great to me. I just can't, you know, it's just, I just, I need to. The pace. The, well, I just need to pay attention to my family. You know, I can't throw my life into all this stuff 24 seven all the time. And so I did, I uh, went to Coke a couple of years and, and, uh, it was boring. <laughs> and so you know, it was a great company. I had a great job. Well, it's a company it, versus an entrepreneur, yeah, really, right? There, you know, in, in, in the, the first year they're you know, briefing me on what I need to do, you know, doing my review and it's don't talk to people on the elevator anymore. Don't yell down the hall. Don't do that. I said, well, how about my job? How am I, you're doing your job. Great. But it's all, you know, like the dressing or something, just the trappings. And so I thought, well, they don't like me, but, um, but yeah, after a couple of years, I thought, well, this isn't for me, but I thought if I was in the PR business, I could work for Coke and for Ted. And, uh, you know, Ted, even when I was at Coke, would still call and if he had a big interview or something, want me to handle it. And I thought, Ted, I don't work for you anymore. So I know that, I know that, but I need you to do this. So, um, and that was, that turned out to be pretty good. And then uh, our firm was bought by Burson Marsteller, which is the largest PR firm in New York. And then I went to New York for- So you lived in New York how long? Uh, five years, five and a half years. So what'd you think about that versus I, Atlanta? I, well, I love it. Atlanta's home. You know, home is always home. New York was exciting for me. And, uh, but I, I never thought I wanted to, to stay there. I mean, I was like a kid from Disney, you know, going to Disney. It was like being on vacation. Yeah, almost. I just wanted to go there and see what it was like. I mean, I just wanted to figure out how it worked. And, <laughs> and you know, I, New York's a machine. And once I figured out the machine, I mean, after, you know, a couple of years up there, you knew the machine, you knew that you could make it, you know, it's the old Frank Sinatra, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Well, um, I knew I could make it. I mean, I was like, I was doing fine. I got offered a couple of really big jobs in, uh, in, in industries I knew nothing about because you're in New York, people, you know, you got, it's like being a CEO of a big company, you don't have to know anything. You just got to put some people in place who do know stuff. And, uh, and then I was offered uh, when the Gulf War uh, broke after it was settled, uh, they had a Gulf War ticker tape parade, and I was uh, asked to be uh, chairman of the ticker tape parade. Well, that was a fairly prestigious mm. assignment, so it was by the mayor. And so uh, I thought, well, nobody's, if I leave now, nobody's going to say you failed, you know, because up there the pressure is if you leave New York, people are going to say, oh, you couldn't make it. So I thought, well, now at least they'll think I've made it. So I left. All right, so tell us about Honduras. How'd you get involved in that? And well, you know, it's funny how uh, things just affect you uh, in different ways. And I've had a couple of charities that touched me one years ago with cystic fibrosis, which I told them I absolutely would never do anything, never heard of it, didn't know what it was, never met anybody. And then they told me to come to the board meeting and they showed me uh, that in that case, it was an orphan disease and they had to pay for all the research and that when they started, the average lifespan was three years and that was up to 30 years. And and I thought, well, damn, what they do is worthwhile. So I got really involved in that. And then um, I have a friend, Jerry Eikhoff, and Jerry called me and 
and Hurricane Mitch, he had something called Honduras Outreach he'd worked on in a ranch in extreme rural Honduras. Uh, my wife had been down there visiting a couple of times with churches. My uh, youngest daughter spent a summer down there, but they would always say it's not something you'd like. You know, it's too rough. You know, you don't like roughing it. You don't like camping. You don't like, and so you'll never, you know, just kind of like you, you can't go. Well, when Hurricane Mitch hit, they needed a lot of help just getting uh, food and relief and water and all into that area there because USAID and all these organizations that jump in to help send it to the cities. They don't send it to the rural areas. And so I would go on a Saturday morning, help them pack up the stuff. And then I made some calls. And one of the calls that Jerry asked me to make, he said, can you call Coke and Pepsi and see if they'll send water? And so I called uh, Coke and called Phil Marino, the CEO of Pepsi, and said, Phil, I'm working with a group in rural Honduras and and they need water now after the hurricane. They just don't have water. Um, can I give you the phone number of a retired army general that's handling the logistics and can you possibly send them water? And he said, well, let me take the number. Well, that's the last I heard. You know, it was a two minute phone call. So finally I got, had, had so much grief about that I would never go down there. I told him, I'm going down there. I just want to show you I can survive it. So they, it, it became sort of a joke. So they, took me down there and they gave me a little tour of the valley and all the needs. And, and it was, I mean, there were dirt roads, 11 hours through the mountains. It was so remote. I thought, Oh my God, this is crazy. You get to the ranch and the ranch was not real domesticated. So it was a little, little roughing it, you know, the roof leaked and the bathrooms leaked and the, you know, it just uh, wasn't real comfortable. But then, um, one of the, you know, one of the little side ventures we did is they said, we're going to take you up to a remote village just so we see what it's like. So they took me, uh, we drive up this little road in the, you know, all terrain vehicle as far as we could go. And then we hiked for about an hour and we're up in the mountains in this little village. And the mayor calls all the villagers together and maybe there were 40 of them, 50 of them. And he's introducing people and he said, uh, this is Mr. Hope. He said, Mr. Hope is the one who saved our lives. He got us the water. And I thought, God, it takes so little, you know, wow. to, to help. And um, so I just made one little phone call. And so uh, before I left, I said, well, look, I, I don't really, you know, I don't view myself as a, a religious leader or anything like that. So um, I don't think I'd want to come down here with a church group. And I don't think it's my, I mean, I, I appreciate what they're doing, but it's not my job to tell somebody how to live. Um, what can I do to help? And he said, well, we, we don't have schools down here. We're just building a school building <laughs> the first time, but we don't even have teachers and we need some support there. And can you put together some folks that'll come down here and maybe address the schools? So I just started calling friends. And I think the first trip I had maybe 10 people come with me and we're, we're sort of assessing what needs to be done. And then we did that a couple of times assessing. Then we realized there was nobody really to do it. You know, we could tell them what they need to be done, but they didn't have any money or the resources. So we set up a foundation to raise the money and uh, to help the schools down there. And, and, uh, and we've done it, I guess, 24 years. And, and uh, next trip we go on, we have 62 people, you know, business leaders primarily from Atlanta and raise a good bit of money and, I tell people the school down there is better than schools here. You're better than public schools here. It's just, and I tried to figure out why, uh, because we had them assessed by the University of South Florida bilingual education department. And they s told us all the stuff we were doing wrong because we're not educators. We just had, right, right. and so I thought, well, how in the world could they be better? And he said, well, you have something that, uh, the U S doesn't have anymore. You have kids who want to be in school. So these kids are motivated. And I thought, well, that's true. I mean, they got, they ride horses for an hour. They will you know, walk from the mountains to get to school. And so it's they really want to be there. It's a privilege. It really is. Yeah. And so, uh, but to answer your question, that's a long way to get there is you just get wrapped up in it and you believe in it. And others who go down there, uh, a good percentage of them get hooked up and believe in it too. And it's, uh, you've been down there. It's, uh, um, it's, you know, some people go down to see it once and see what it's like. Others go down and say, I just want to see the improvement each year. I want to make friends. And we've passed the point where I really feel like, you know, that we're doing wondrous good for them. I tell you, it, I tell everybody now we're going down there because it's going to be wondrous good for you. 
It's going to make you yeah, appreciate yeah, your life yeah. here more. It's going to make you understand these people are far more like you than they are different. And you got That's, Vince Dooley to go. Oh, you yeah. got the Vince well, Dooley well, feel. What was your relationship with Vince? Well, Vince and I go way back. I mean, when I was with the Braves, I, I can hardly remember a time I didn't know Vince from the time I was 20 years old. And, you know, he uh, whenever there was a, an issue, uh, he had uh, an issue over there with uh, one of the professors that was giving him a hard time because he felt they were giving preferential treatment to football players, which probably were, but that's, uh, but, you know, he had to sort of battle through that. And then, um, so we had, you know, we basically built a friendship off of that, just stayed in touch over the years. And when I was calling all my friends, the first time I was going down there, I would call anybody I knew saying, would you, you know, I want you to go to Honduras. And I called Vince and he said, um, can't do it. But he said, someday I'll do it. I'll do it. Well, I called him the next couple of years and he didn't go. So I just took him off the list. And he called me about, you know, after 10 years after my first trip and <laughs> said, are you still going to Honduras? And I said, yes, I am. He said, well, I told you I'd go someday. I'm ready to go. So he started going down there and, and he just, uh, you know, it just touched him. I mean, he really was, um, you know, they, uh, you know, they had no idea why he was a legend here. I mean, they don't about American football, but they knew a legend was coming down there to see him. And he was so engaging with the kids and the teachers and all, they would just, you know, gravitate around him, and it was just, uh, it was just a wonderful experience. Barbara <laughs> is what, you know, we, we always went over their anniversary, and so Barbara was not pleased with the trip, and Barbara said there was no way that she was going to ride 11 hours through the mountains to anywhere, and she just was not going to go, and one year Vince called me, he said, well, Barbara's going next year. I'm going to get Barbara to go, and I said, all right, good luck, and so we're having dinner with, uh, Vince and Barbara, and I said, Barbara, I understand you're going on the trip next year. She said, no way I'm going on that trip. Vince isn't going. You're not getting him down there again. <laughs> I said, oh, well, he told me you were going. No way. And then Vince called me a couple of weeks later. He said, Barbara's going. Put her on the list. She's going. <laughs> so the next time I saw her, I said, Barbara, I understand you're going with us. She said, I'm going to hate every minute of it. And I said, well, Barbara, let me tell you something. I said, you are going to love it. You are going to love it when you get there. She said, it would take a miracle for me to like that. And I said, Barbara, there are miracles. And of course, she gets down there and she just absolutely loves it. She has the best time of anybody. Mm. And the next year when I started recruiting, she was the first one to And it's on their anniversary. It was anniversary. always on their Oh, yeah. We, we had a great anniversary. So, in fact, the day that Vince Dooley Field was dedicated, that night, that was their anniversary. And that night, we had a big party and their kids and their grandkids all did a video for us to show. And, you know, it was just a yeah. fun, fun deal. All right, tell me about PR stuff, marketing stuff. What's going on right now that people are not thinking about or businesses need to be doing more of? What do you, what well, do you I, see? I think they're, you know, um, first of all, it, it, and you know this, it, it all gets back to the story and how the story is being communicated. You know, people get so wrapped up and, you know, we got to have social media, we have to have that. Well, it's all about the content. It always has been about the content. If you have a strong story, people, and a meaningful story, people are going to pay attention. And also the other thing, um, in just addressing how a business positions itself internally, externally, or whatever, uh, everything communicates. I know uh, James Quincy, the CEO of Coke, tells a story about the, his first week on the job. He decided to address all their employees, have a big meeting, and and tell him his vision, his plan, and you know, get into it. And he said what he found out the next couple of weeks is the only thing they remembered was he was wearing jeans, which was so you know, unusual for their culture. So right. he, didn't, wasn't, he said it wasn't intentional, but he and he said it did good because it loosened up the culture some. But he said you just realize that whatever you do ha has a communication aspect to it, and and you see it happen all the time. It was just. Uh, you know, there are certain things that go on that sometimes elude you. you don't pay attention. I, I just uh, got a book uh, from Gallup on uh, called Blind Spot. It said that uh, what the world leaders and, and corporate leaders didn't notice the last few years is over the last 10 to 20 years, particularly the last 10 years, is that the un unhappiness in the world has gotten so severe and just to a point where basically even... Uh, CDC just did a, uh, a report that said 60% um, of all young women say they're miserable. 
right? Forty percent all you know, just and that that just wasn't the case. So um, yeah, I think there are issues like that that can be addressed in some way. And if you're going to address them effectively, you got to uh, you got to communicate. I mean, management is, is the story the way to communicate. Is that I think it, it, the content is. Content. And sometimes, um, but is the content telling a story? I mean, when you say you content, want, when you say content, content is what people perceive. I mean, it can be uh, visual. It can be, uh, you know, now if you go to the University of Georgia and you take a journalism class, the first thing they teach you is, is uh, video and photography. You know, because people respond so much right. to visually. So it's uh, it's just however you communicate. So do more businesses need to create more content? Well, I think they create. Out. I think they create a lot of content. I think they need to look and say, um, you know, one of the things I found when I was in New York, my job was to primarily was or hanging around CEOs of big companies. And I used to sit there just watching. I said, well, you know, Warren Buffett versus Jack Welch or whoever it was, you know, they're different. So what what's the common denominator? You know, why are they so great and others aren't? And I realized fairly quickly that they could condense a message to something that's easily understood that they didn't try to, you know, uh, what they say, the difference in a great businessman and a, and a great academic is the academic takes something really simple and makes it complex. And the great business person takes something complex and makes it very simple. And, and people need to do that. Just more. to, just to be able to say, okay, we're going to say something succinctly that's going to sink in. Everybody's going to understand it. If you're a company, uh, you know, it's, it's like playing the game of telephone. Whatever you say at the top, if it's too complicated, by the time it gets to the bottom, it's going to be totally convoluted. So you have to, add, you know, and you don't have to communicate in volume. A lot of folks think more, you know, the more stuff we put out there, the the better we're communicating. Right. Sometimes the more stuff you put out there, the worse you communicate. You can over overdo it, right? Yeah, and you also just confuse people. So do, what, is TV and radio still good marketing Oh yeah, no. I, I mean, people, people will say there's no such thing as mainstream media. Well, there's definitely mainstream media. I mean, and by the way, that's how a lot of the other media is driven by mainstream media. And mainstream media is important in today's world, probably more so for different reasons than it ever has been. One is it prioritizes what the news is. You know, if you look at a news in newspaper, whatever's on the front page at the top is you know somebody's judged as the most important right. story. And then it sort of goes down. Well, right now, if you all you do is go on social media and stuff's been, being thrown at you, how in the world do you figure out what's more important? What's important? You need somebody who's expert at uh, sort of analyzing that kind of stuff, kind of giving you guidance as to what really is important. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny because I'm noticing that that I'm like um, like um, what do you call it? Mailbox marketing. What's the word for that? where you get flyers and oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, direct mail. Direct, direct mail is all of a sudden seems to be, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm getting the mail more than I used to, but there's still a tremendous amount of direct mail going on. And then you've got a lot of people still, you know, trying to figure out how to do lead generation on the internet. Oh, yeah. And, and it's, uh, I mean, I, I don't know all the answers. I will say that, um, you know, you hear these little one-liners that people kind of, buy into one of them when you talk about mail is people will say, well, you know, it, you know, we get so much email now that it's a real treat when I get an actual letter. Right. So what happens then everybody starts writing letters. Right. Right. Kind of, and then there'll be a time where I can't even read all my mail. I got to, you know, right. read my email. So. But what do you think most small businesses are not doing from a marketing standpoint, public relations standpoint? I, I think just telling their story well. You know, you got You can't be all things to all people, and I think you know, we're guilty of that. Even you, you know, it's better to be, uh, you know, expert in one thing than be a mile wide and inch deep. So, so like, um, I'm trying to think of a guy's name that has the book called Story, it's a story book, story something, and he talks about people are are marketing and they're making themselves the character where they need to be making themselves the the guide for somebody. And so you see that like in real estate, I'm a multi-million dollar producer, yeah. I'm blah, blah, blah. And he's saying, no, you need to figure out what their problem is and tell them that you well, can guide it, them through that, right? Well, I, and I do think with a lot of, you know, relative to at least in our business, I don't know, and I assume this holds true with any consulting type of business, is, um, is Companies don't like to sit down and sort of reflect and analyze what their real needs are. 
you know, they want to tell you, we want you to go do this. And, you know, we used to, uh, in a cynical way, say that uh, when you're pre when I was in New York, say if you're presenting to a prospect, don't ever present to them what you think they ought to do. Even if you're right, they may have already decided right. there's something wrong You and the meeting's right. over with. And I think sometimes, particularly small businesses or big businesses are headstrong. I mean, big business will analyze things so, you know, I remember Doug Ivester when he was the CEO of Coca-Cola, who actually was a pretty good CEO um, at a tough time. Uh, he used to say the problem I have with our folks is they'll come up with a really good idea and then 20 other people want to get involved in fleshing out the idea. And then when it finally comes to me, I can't figure out what the original idea was. Screwed it up. And uh, Chuck Fruit, who was the head of uh, advertising at Budweiser and then went to Coke, uh, talked, you know, but this, and he was there when Budweiser came up with all these clever ads and got right. all these awards. He said it was so simple because the ad agency would bring it to Budweiser. They'd look at it, so that's a great ad, make two or three comments, then they'd go run it. He said the difference at Coca-Cola is they send it over to Coca-Cola America, North America to look at. Then they send, you know, he said there are 40 different people that have their say on it. And they all And somebody is going to get screwed up. And they'll all, and somebody will come back and say, well, this might offend so-and-so. This might offend so-and-so. This might offend so-and-so. Right. I saw that. I mean, I've, yesterday we were working on a, a program to help the police, you know, for company. Ah, oh, we can't talk about the police. There'll be too much negative reaction if we talk about the police. I said, what? <laughs> but they just, you know, people. So how are companies, I mean, what's happening out there? Because they're, you know, everybody's saying everybody's getting so woke, right? I mean, everybody's yeah. so scared. Well, I think you would just need to get rid of those terms. I mean, uh, Chris Womack, the CEO of, uh, of Southern Company, gives a great speech. And he said, you know, what is woke? What's the definition of woke? Woke is caring about other people, doing things that, he said, so what's wrong with that? You know, we just did politicize the word. Right. And said, okay, that's a way to take it to the extreme. We'll say this person's woke or this person's whatever. And I think what we got to do is just, you know, treat people like treat, you know, people. Treat it by fair. Yeah, don't, uh, you yeah, know, it's funny. We did some work with uh, the Koch, K-O-C-H Foundation. And they, you know, they're very controversial. The Koch brothers and all, right. and all this stuff. And you, you look at what they give their money to and they give their money to a, uh, a solution. You know, they don't care who's doing the solution, but somebody will look and say, well, they've given the money to this foundation and they do all this bad stuff. And they don't look at where they're giving the money that they're giving it to a part of the foundation. Trying to make good things work. And, work. and I think we're too prone sometimes to just look for the negative first. You know, if we mm -hmm. just get everybody to look for the positive, you know, respect everybody, you know, be like Hank Aaron, you know, be like Phil Necro. Just, uh, you know, see the good in people before you look for the bad. Awesome. Thank you, Bob. Y'all appreciate Bob being on. I hope y'all learned some Atlanta history like I did. So thanks for tuning in to another episode of Beach Talks. All right, man. Thanks, thanks, thanks. That's awesome, Bob. Thanks. Wow. Keep us it was your fun. Stories.